So the first of the transmission precautions that we're going to talk about are contact precautions. And you can see the picture that I have there. That's um, a poster on contact precautions, just gives an overview of uh, what's required and we'll go into those in more detail. But for where contact precautions or later on you'll see droplet precautions where they're needed, it is recommended that signage is put up on the residence room and posters like the one I'm showing you there can be got uh, online. So basically contact precautions. Contact precautions, as this, this, uh, the, the name intimates is um, to do with where you could end up getting the, the virus transmitted through contact. So basically it should be used for infections that can be transmitted by direct contact with the resident. COVID-19 can be transmitted through direct contact, but also indirectly when in contact with contaminated surfaces, such as tables, personal items that the resident is using and equipment that's been used for the resident. So contact precautions involve the use of hand washing and the use of personal protective equipment. And again, it's important with hand washing, that hand washing is the first and last thing that should be done for any procedure or intervention. So hands should be washed before and after contact with the resident and their surroundings and before and after using PPE. And it's just worth noting that as far as we know at the moment, and obviously we're still finding out more about the virus, but current evidence does suggest that COVID can remain viable for hours to days on surfaces made from a variety of materials. One of the things that's um, said out there is that for the likes of cardboard, the COVID virus can remain on cardboard for about 24 hours and for metal and plastic it can remain for about three days and that's worth keeping in mind in relation to ensuring that contact precautions are in place. So what do we mean by contact precautions uh, from a practical point of view? Well basically it's about using single-use nitrile gloves for all direct care with a resident using single nitrile gloves for all contact with surfaces in the residence room, again, including those personal items and equipment. It means using a plastic apron for indirect contact, such as when cleaning the residence room or equipment. Now, in the case of cleaning, the plastic apron would be used when you can pretty much guarantee that you're going to be greater than a meter from the resident the whole time. If on the other hand, work is going to be done that involves having to be within a meter distance of the resident, a fluid resistant full sleeve gown is required. So that means all direct contact with the resident, the staff member should wear a full sleeve fluid resistant gown. So in addition to contact precautions, droplet precautions are a requirement for when either if you're present in the room or actually engaged with the resident when aerosol generating procedures are being undertaken. So we look at what that means. So droplet precautions are needed for COVID-19 as it can be transmitted by droplets that are generated by the resident if they're coughing, sneezing, talking, or when performing cough and juice procedures. So for example, a resident that might need sputum induction, maybe the administration of aer aerosolized medications such as nebulized medications or airway suctioning. So in these situations, if you're present in the room when these are being carried out, or for any staff member that's involved in providing this sort of care or treatment, contact and droplet precautions will be needed. And that involves, again, your single use nitrile gloves, use of a fluid resistant full sleeve gown instead of the plastic apron, use of a surgical face mask, type 11 or is what's being recommended by the HSPC, and the use of goggles. All of the above should be used when you're going to be within a meter from the resident. It's important to note that the advice that's being given at the moment is to try and avoid spending more than 15 minutes in direct contact with a resident with COVID-19. 
Now, this can be difficult in terms of giving direct care, but it is what's being advised that work is arranged and care is arranged around a situation where uh, a staff member can avoid being more than 15 minutes. And we do know that what will be happening is outside the door of any resident, there will be a sheet or it may be within the room, a sheet where each member of staff will sign when they've gone in and when they've left so that it can be um, worked out how much time that each person has spent with the person and what they've done so that if they're more than 15 minutes in direct contact that that can be monitored. Okay, so airborne precautions. Well, these are required when the staff member is present or engaged in an aerosol generating activity. So it's pretty much the droplet precautions that we talked about in the last slide. And again, just to emphasize that requires full length fluid resistant gown, surgical face mask type two or single use nitride gloves and the use of goggles. So the next precaution in relation to infection prevention and control to prevent the spread of infection to prevent transmission is about appropriate resident placement. So that starts with anyone who's suspected of um, being infected with COVID-19. So any resident with suspected based on symptoms that are present or confirmed COVID-19 must be isolated using both contact and droplet precautions in addition to standard precautions. Ideally, the resident should be accommodated in a single room with their own bathing and toiling facilities. In some instances, this may not be possible. And if it's not possible, what's recommended is that the resident is cohorted in groups of two to four with other contacts. It's important that the resident is requested to avoid communal areas, so the resident stays in their room. However, if the resident is able and if it's safe for them to do so, they may go outside alone to outside spaces, outdoor spaces in the nursing home. And they can do that provided that they'll be able to maintain a distance of at least a meter from others. If on the other hand, the resident wishes to go outside, but does need to be accompanied by a staff member, the staff member accompanying the resident doesn't need to wear PPE if that staff member can maintain a distance of at least a metre from the resident. However, if the staff member needs to have close personal contact, needs to assist the person with, with, with mobility, say for example, or to be closer than a metre distant, then they will need to wear personal protective equipment. In instances where the resident does need to go through an occupied chair space to get to that outdoor space, they must be encouraged to wash their hands beforehand and wear a surgical mask. Now for residents, it can be difficult, particularly where you have residents maybe with cognitive impairment, it may be difficult to get them to wear a surgical mask or some residents may feel it very uncomfortable or intimidated by using it. And in this case, what we ask residents to do is to get a tissue and cover their mouth and nose with the tissue while they're going through an occupied shared space. And another important element of resident placement is that nominated staff are rostered to care for affected residents. So as again to minimise the contacts. So per shift, management would nominate specific staff members to care for residents. And in the situation where there is an outbreak, residents would be cohorted to a particular area. Some people have been doing that using fire zones and designating those areas for, for cohorting uh, residents. In these situations, again, management will nominate particular staff, nominated staff, who will work in those areas, again, to reduce contacts. Other important elements of resident placement and transmission based precautions are to do with visitor restrictions. And as we know in the beginning, back on the 3rd of March, um, it was recommended that visitors would be restricted to just one visitor per, per resident. The current advice is to restrict visitors apart from those that are 
essential. So all non-essential visitors into the home are restricted. Uh, another important element is to keep equipment to a minimum in a residence room where feasible, again, to minimize the risk of surface contact contamination. So where at all possible, only the equipment that the resident is going to need should be kept in the room. And I know there can be difficult with the, difficulty with this because there'll be some residents that for personalizing their rooms will have a lot of items in it. But again, the aim is to try and minimize the amount of equipment that's in a residence room. Equipment um, for particularly PPE um, for the residence room should be supplied on a daily basis to prevent overstocking. Also, this is a very good way of being able to monitor the amount of PPE that is being used. So a member of staff could be nominated to provide equipment at the beginning of each shift to staff members based on the number of residents that they have been nominated to care for. Equipment in the room should include your appropriate color coded bins. So again, we'll be talking about healthcare risk waste bins, PPE for the room. And again, that's going to include the range of PPE that may be required. So your gloves, your plastic aprons, your um, full sleeve fluid resistant gowns, your goggles and your surgical face masks. It's very important that alcohol rubber gel is also in the room. Now, some, some people may put this at the end of the bed. There are containers where it can be hung over the end of the bed, but it's very important that it is in the room for you know people taking off their PPE to be able to wash their hands after they take off their gloves, or if they have to change their PPE in between different procedures. If the resident is going to need a dedicated commode, bedpan or urable urinal, that needs also to be kept in the room. And that would be if somebody doesn't have ensuite facilities. Again, all waste needs to be considered healthcare risk waste. So ideally, the resident will have dedicated equipment. However, if this isn't possible at the time, shared equipment will be used. So things like SVIG, um, and other types of equipment. And if that is the case, staff must ensure that it's cleaned and disinfected before removal from the room. In the event that a commode is being used, um, healthcare workers should leave the isolation room wearing full PPE, transport the commode directly to the nearest sluice and remove PPE in the sluice after placing the contents in the bedpan washer. It's a good idea to have a second healthcare worker who can shadow that worker so as to open the isolation room and sluice room doors. It's also important at this time for healthcare workers to take time to explain to the resident what's going on. So for a resident, it can be very intimidating and frightening to see people coming into the room wearing gowns, wearing masks, wearing goggles. So it's important to explain to the resident the importance of these precautions, why the precautions are in place, and um, to reassure them about any concerns that they have. Um, so listen and respond to any concerns that the resident may have to ensure support and as well to ensure optimal compliance is achieved during their care. Any resident that is particularly uh, anxious or concerned, again, um, to provide as much reassurance as possible to that resident and if needs be to get somebody more um, higher up that could come in and talk to the resident. At the same time, trying to keep in mind that we want to reduce contacts. It's important to put droplet signage on the doors, on, on bedroom doors. And again, as I was saying, you can download those um, from uh, the website, from different websites, the CDC, HSPC, and um, somebody will be nominated at administrative level to make sure that there is supply of those and that they are being erected outside bedroom doors. Hand hygiene units and healthcare risk waste bins are required at all entrances and exits to 
areas where residents are being cohorted. So we talked earlier on, we mentioned about there might be particular compartments, such as, for example, a particular fire zone where people are being cohorted. And it's at the entrance and exit that we need hand hygiene units and healthcare risk waste bins. Because again, people who are leaving the unit will need to take off PPE equipment, such as maybe people who have come from um, the kitchen to deliver meals, um, as well as people who are entering the, un the, the unit or affected area. It's also important, as we mentioned, that a record of all healthcare workers in contact with the resident is maintained. So this is where we'll use the record sheet placed outside the door or within the, the room for all healthcare workers entering and leaving to complete the record and include the timing and duration of exposure. From a practical point of view, healthcare workers who aren't familiar with this guidance or local recommendations for assessing and managing suspected or confirmed residents should really not be uh, involved in, in these circumstances. Um, arrangements should be in place for healthcare works involved in the care of suspected cases or confirmed cases to have access to an occupational health team and emergency contact details for out of hours advice in the event that they develop symptoms or if they have a breach in PPE. Now, what we mean by that is where they um, forget or make a mistake in putting on or taking off their PPE and have contact without protection or where they've contact for an extended period of time that goes far beyond the 15 minutes of direct contact. So healthcare workers who provide direct care examination to a possible confirmed case need to follow occupational health guidelines in relation to self-monitoring and reporting of symptoms. And these occupational health gui guidelines should be available in each centre. And what it means basically is just keeping an eye on yourself to see if you're developing any symptoms, signs or symptoms that could be associated with having COVID. It is recommended that in centres that healthcare worker temperatures would be taken on a daily basis, just again for monitoring to make sure that people don't have symptoms. And again, for anybody who has particular concerns for their own health and their own protection, the HSE has set a helpline uh, and it is available for nursing homes. So the contact number is 1850 420 420. And the helpline is available from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. from Monday through to Friday and from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays. So again, in summary, what are the key principles that we want to keep in mind all the time for pre preventing the spread of COVID-19 in a residential healthcare facility? Well, adherence to standard precautions with all individuals at all times early identification of potential cases so that we can implement the additional contact and droplet precautions. Promotion of respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette among staff, among residents and essential visitors to the centre. Provision of up-to-date information about the virus. So we're, we're getting updated information as um, scientists and the medical people learn more about the virus and it's very important that the centre will have access to that update information and be able to disseminate that to staff. It's important as well to avoid unnecessary direct physical contact with individuals who may be infected. Again, avoiding exposures to respiratory secretions through the use of droplet precautions and at all times being able to liaise with local public health specialists to provide advice throughout a COVID emergency. So that's the end of this session and next Andrea is going to take over and she's going to look at the use of hand hygiene and the importance of hand hygiene in preventing the spread of infection as well as the use of personal protective equipment to protect yourselves and to protect the spread of infection. Thank you for listening.